Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you today, Joel? Um, I, so I've been listening to the um, the Happiness Lab, and um, there was a like a mini um, season that she did on um, sort of ancient um, wisdom and how that that applies to um, scientific findings of today. And she was talking about stoicism mm-hmm. um, and how um, we can take a mindset of when we're um, confronted with challenging life experiences, we can view it as a, um, you know, a, a challenge from the stoic gods that we can rise to the occasion. Um, and so today I found that um, unlike the Black Keys song about gold on the ceiling, I have mold in my ceiling. Um, so once again, the stoic gods are, are challenging me and um, I just have to show them that I'm up to it. Well, the good thing is, Joel, you get to come to People Diagnostics every day and then come to work and you get to hang out with me and Ryan and some of our other devs. So that's got to be something that brightens up your day. Sure. <laughs> Let's just go with that. If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we've, we've got an awesome guest on today, so I'm sure we're going to have a great chat. Uh, in fact, if I can introduce him, uh, this is our first person we're talking about before who not only hails uh, from Sweden, but mainland Europe. So first for both. Uh, and he's been working in uh, the armed forces in Sweden as a military psychologist for more than a decade. He's currently working towards a PhD with a research focus on military psychology and stress. Welcome to the podcast, Nicholas Wisen. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Uh, and uh, it's a privilege to be here as the first one from representing Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big honor and a big responsibility. So <laughs> I'll see if I can change your view on, on mainland European psychologist. I don't know. <laughs> oh, we've got nothing against mainland European psychologists, Nicholas. No. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been. Maybe, you, maybe you will have after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't say that he'd uh, change our opinion in a positive way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I'm um, looking at the video. It looks like you're in an interrogation room, which is a little bit scary because I know you work in the military and uh, psychology. So um, are you in an interrogation room? Um, basically not. I'm actually in my, I can do this little, uh, I'm actually in my kitchen. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so it, but it was a little bit messy. So I actually um, just showed this uh, white wall as a background. So. Yeah, so okay. I'm at home. Uh, uh, we were we are working from home. Uh, I think that today is actually the first day where both of my kids are in, in uh, school for a couple of months now. So uh, we have been working at home from for quite some time. Yeah. So that's the first time in two months that you've been kid free. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And uh, we have a ca- kind of large apartment. I live in, inside of Stockholm. The co- Stockholm is the capital of, of Sweden. And I, I, I live in the, in, in the, in the, in the inner city. And uh, we actually have been uh, um, quite free to, 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 to move around, but uh, still we have been uh, work, working from home. And, and when the kids are home, it doesn't really work out that well uh, we, it, this apartment is, is it's kind of a, a big apartment but we still we don't have like three or four offices with, within it so you have to work with the kitchen table and uh, it's not optimal but it works yeah some sort of cruel psychology experiment it sounds like being trapped <laughs> in, a, in an apartment with two young yeah, you have, you'll have to learn how to compromise within your family and it's a different when you work together very close with, with colleagues there's another kind of uh, barrier between you um, than it is with family uh, family have lost uh, some sometimes less boundaries uh, when it comes to distracting one another and i I get like 200 questions a day. Daddy, can you fix this? And daddy, can you do mm-hmm. that? And when it's at lunch and uh, all of those things that <laughs> kind of dis- yep. disrupt the, the workflow. Yeah, very familiar so, with that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Nicholas, um, let's get yeah. straight into it. Can you tell us about some of your favorite podcasts? Actually, I can. Uh, I, I, I don't... Uh, I don't really listen so much to any particular podcast because I'm, I'm not that loyal to anyone. I have been listening to a lot of your podcasts and, and, uh, and I think they are really great. Uh, as I mentioned before, be, before this started, I, I, I think that 
when you when you feel that you get both a little bit entertained, but you also can bring something with you after, afterwards, some kind of thought, uh, it, it's a good one. And one of the one podcasts that I have liked the most, it was one really early one. I don't think it's around anymore. It, it's uh, with, with this uh, um, Dan Ariely, you know him, behavioral economist from Duke University. He's written a lot of books, but he also had a podcast called Arming the Donkeys. And it was really short episodes. I think they were like 10 to 15 minutes where he interviewed some uh, research, uh, some scientists uh, that they were doing uh, research within the area or around the area of behavioral economy. And that, that's a really good one. There are still uh, a couple of hundred epido- episodes out there, so I can rec- recommend it. Uh, I also like to listen to Russell Brand, uh, this uh, American actor, comedian, and I don't know what actually how to label him, but I think he's, he's also really insightful and, and really fun to, to listen to. And he, he, he does a lot of things that is more has more depth to it than one could imagine from his profession and his movie. And also I, I listen to some uh, some TED Talks. I don't know if that counts as podcast, but uh, TED Talks are, are, are quite good uh, as well to get this diversity of ideas that in, inspires you. Mm. No, I so think that, we, we can yeah. say that TED Talks fit into the, the category. Yeah. 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 But we'll allow it. Yeah. 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 Just, <laughs> for, the, for this time, yeah. Just yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, can you tell us about your, your career then? Um, it sounds very interesting and um, quite different to the other guests that we've had on. Yeah, I think so. I... I, I uh, I started to work as a security guard uh, after I left school and, and I worked for, for many years within different kind of professions where you don't really have to have an education at all. So, and, and I think that that has been a, a great learning experience. Um, I've been working with uh, paper recycling. I've been working with uh, mechanics. I've been working with a lot of different areas where you get to know people from very diverse parts of society. Uh, and I, I think it was in my late twenties, I was starting to get gain some in, interest in, in, in psychology. So actually I, I started and took this first one, uh, one semester uh, course in, in psychology. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. This is something that I wanna, wanna do. And uh, I went into psychology, Psychology studies uh, in Sweden is a five-year uh, program and it's equivalent to a, like a master's degree in, in psychology. And then I started working as a psychologist. You do one year afterwards where, where you become licensed uh, under supervision. So I, 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 and, and I did that and I started to work with uh, first uh, within forensic psychology, um, individual assessment. Uh, uh, and after that, I went to, into working with youth, uh, criminal youth, uh, basically the same as forensic psychology, but it's, it's another governmental organization that goes behind it. And there, so it, it was kind of interesting uh, as well. And uh, eventually, I started working in, in a clinical setting, also with uh, parent parent training for uh, kids with acting act uh, acting out. Uh, pro- problems uh, and I also had kids of my own and I realized this is really hard <laughs> so so uh, I worked for some time uh, and um, but I didn't think that this is really not my my area uh, to, to work with and then I got an offer from a from, from a friend who was working as a, the head psychologist in the Swedish Armed Forces and said that well we, we are thinking about putting some already uh, academics in, into uh, uh, officer training uh, are you interested so actually I, I quit my I quit my psychology job uh, I went uh, down to this was actually one of, one of these uh, turning points where, where I had to go from my well reasonably well paid psychology job to actually uh, go into officer school where you don't get paid you get like this uh, 
small uh, amount every month just to cover uh, the basics because you get free housing and free food and, and everything. So, um, and I also had a family at home. So I said, well, I, I need to make this investment. So I went there for a little bit more than a year. Uh, it was a shorter version because I already had the uh, theoretical uh, academic uh, qualifications. So, so I went there and uh, after that, uh, that was in 2007, I've been working uh, within the armed forces. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I also started part-time to, to pursue a, a PhD. Uh, and that PhD is within, as you mentioned, the, the area of, of military psychology and, and, and stress in, in specific uh, environments, both in training situations and uh, also in the deployment, because the deployment area has been the, the main area where I've been working. And I was deployed as an operational psychologist in Mali in 2017. So, um, um, but uh, that's, that's what I'm doing at the time. And it is planned for me to be done with my PhD this uh, this fall, some hopefully in November, December, um, if everything goes as, it, as it's supposed to, it was actually supposed to be that the last year, but this has been a really crazy year. Uh, and uh, I, I will get the opportunity later to tell you about it, but uh, we, we've been working with these models from the military within the Swedish healthcare uh, with great success. So it was like I was pushing the pause button and working with uh, where work was needed uh, instead of just pursuing my PhD this year. So it's been delayed one year. And after that, I, I will see, I will go back to the armed forces pro probably and continue that 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 area. And I think that's also an important thing to to bring the experience there from, from there out in the civil society. Yeah, so that's, so. that's it. Yeah. A lot, I think a lot of people's um, plans got put on pause um, in the last 12 months, yeah, to sort of refocus on, on other things. Um, so yeah, you, you're not alone in that, in that situation. No. Yeah. It's probably a better excuse than what I had to postpone my dissertation for my master's degree. So, which is, I just couldn't be bothered doing it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> pandemics are always a good excuse, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, <laughs> well, we'll find out more about um, your PhD and research and how you're applying some of that already uh, in healthcare, as you mentioned uh, a little bit later in today's podcast. Um, yeah. But maybe let us know a bit about the local situation in Sweden. What What is the state of uh, workplace mental health uh, in Sweden at the moment? Unfortunately, I must say it's not a, it's not a great state. We are a really uh, privileged country. Uh, I would say we, we, we are a relatively rich country. We have great health care. We have uh, great uh, workplace regulation rules and, and everything. But still, we have this massive increase in uh, work stress-related health issues. It's both psychological and physiological. So um, we, we have there was there was a survey that went out in, in uh, last year, and, and it said that fourteen percent of the population, that was not just related to work, but this 14% of the population experienced negative stress. And when you narrow that down and put it into different age groups, that they, they could see that the age group from some 16 to 29, then there was the 25, that's, that's a fourth of, of the population that actually experienced neg negative stress. Uh, and that's quite an alarming figure, really. Uh, uh, I don't think that it, it really, fits the, the profile for, for burnout. Um, but, but still, it, it's, uh, it's an indication that there are stressors that the populations, population are, are not uh, fit to endure. Uh, and uh, whether that is basically from, from the work or if it's from uh, life in, in general, um, there's a lot of things to say, to say uh, and think, think about that. But we see definitely an increase in, in that stress exposure and negative effects from stress exposure that I would say is in a subclinical realm. Because when we have been looking at all of these figures uh, and they... The experienced psychiatrists say that we don't see an increase really in, in psychiatry. We don't see an increase. There's, there's not more schizophrenia. Hmm. There, there's not more of the, uh, the people with really, really 
deep depression and bipolar disorder and all, all of that. It's basically the same, uh, but there has been a lowered threshold towards seeking support. And that's a good, that's a good part, but it, it, it can also uh, make uh, some, it, it, the statistics might, might be just that, that we discover more, but there is not more. But I think that there, there is a, a stress epidemic. And uh, I looked at some earlier numbers. I said that in, in 2016, there was 80,000, Sweden is a small country, 80,000, uh, sick leaves related to, to stress that year. And that, that's quite a lot. That's quite, that's, that's a lot from an economic kind of per perspective, but it, it's also a lot from an uh, uh, individual suffering perspective. And that you, you can't really put a number on, on that as well. Yeah, what is the population size in uh, in Sweden? I think that now I am. I, 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 sometimes I, I I don't update my my numbers in my mind. So, so Sweden, we are like eight million, but uh, as it turns out, we're like we're grown. So we're like ten million people now. Yeah. Um, so roughly about ten million, and it's quite a long country. Uh, it's quite a large country to to its population. So it's not so crowded uh, outside of the southern part uh, so uh, yeah but similar, similar numbers to what we're seeing in other western societies i think um in australia yeah. uh we have about one in five people each year that was the the latest um who will develop a, a mental disorder so a working age um uh, like you were referencing as well so yeah. similar, most developed countries seem to be about that one in five one in four over a 12-month period yeah, and not necessarily having a mental disorder, but having symptoms of a, a mental disorder or, or stress. Yeah. 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 I think it's alarming. I think that uh, it's a sign that uh, it's it's nothing. It's nothing really wrong with the people. It's something wrong with the environment that we are living in or creating for ourselves that doesn't really it's not a good match between uh, our environment and and uh, uh, what we're experiencing really yeah i mean physiologically us as humans aren't changing uh, much <laughs> you wouldn't think so uh possibly uh yeah you're right it's the environment that's changing and we're not we're not adapting quick enough to it no, we're not, and we will not adapt to it as well because we, we put some of the evolutionary pressures out, out of the game. Uh, so we will, we will not evolve towards adaptation to, to this new. It was really, it, it was, it's a, a great Swedish TV show that uh, has focus on the brain. And, and they did something in the first episode that was quite, quite a, in, interesting, really. They, they, they filled one of our sports arena with 10,000 people. And they said, each and every one here represents one generation of, of humans. Uh, because we have been around for 10,000 generations. And then they said, okay, everybody stand up. So everybody stood up. Uh, and then they said, okay, everybody who hasn't lived their life with electricity, sit down. And everybody except for six people sat down. Now that gives you that perspective. Mm -hmm. of how long have we been living within, within this new modern area that we take for, for granted? And, and, and the, when we brought electricity into our house, there was a lot of things that happened. Actually, we, we changed the circadian rhythm and everything because we could get lightnings light uh, inside of the house uh, and we didn't have to go to bed when it became dark and, and so so and then they said that well everybody who has experienced uh, a car uh, being able to drive during and then a lot of uh, and I, th I think it was uh, four of them that were still still standing and then they said well those of you who have been grown up this generation has been grown up with uh, constant uh, availability of the internet and there's one people one one generation uh, there's so, uh, also a really great book by uh, Sean Twenge about generation uh, i generation it's called i gen uh, that uh, elaborates on that generation it's from the mid 90s and uh, forward they they internet was there when they, grew, when they grew up. And I think that that's one of the culprits when, when we talk about this stress society, this, this cognitive load that we actually experience. Mm, yeah, for sure. Mm. It's really fascinating stuff and an area that I'm um, actually quite interested in. Um, 
but not the area that we decided that we no, were going to talk all. about today. <laughs> um, so you've been working with um, with the military and um, yeah. speaking, if I'm going to adopt the lingo, as a um, civilian. Um, I think most of us who haven't had any experience in the military would expect that um, there are some fairly significant and specific stresses that might be unique to the military. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so, um, when, when we, we, we experience that all the time here, here as well. As when you think, think about the military, uh, the, the military you, you think about uh, combat, combat-related stressor. You think about uh, the, what, what you've seen in the movies. Uh, and uh, you also think, uh, think fairly amount of, of uh, uh, PTSD um, uh, and American movies of all the soldiers that come home with PTSD and can't really work in, in society. And, and that's, that's the truth for many of those who ex- experienced the combat, and especially those who experienced combat also with, with poor preparation. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the uh, war keeping uh, or war uh, combat, uh, uh, the, the countries that have, have uh, soldiers that go, that go into combat missions, um, they they have this uh, uh, they have a hard time also recruiting uh, people. So a lot of those who goes away uh, might have uh, really pre-existing trauma before they go, they go away because they come from for for, for uh, grow, growing up in uh, harsh conditions uh, and uh, they get a lack. They don't have that kind of resources to, to manage what they're experiencing and. Uh, but, but for most, uh, and I think that Australia shares that as well, that you, you have a lot of peacekeeping missions. Uh, your troops are mainly in peacekeeping missions. That's the same in Sweden and for most European countries. We are uh, engaged in peacekeeping missions. Some of the peacekeeping missions can, can be quite combat-like, depending on the mandate you get from, from the UN. Uh, there's peacekeeping and peace enforcing, and with peace enforcing, it's a little bit more active. And uh, so they can experience combat situation uh, as well. And they can also, as they did in the Balkans during the 90s, experience quite a lot of atrocities towards between the, the, the fighting groups. Uh, and, and they are not having the mandates to actually act upon it. They, they can, sometimes they can actually have the resources because they are the stronger part, but they're, they are just forced to witness uh, the, the atrocities and, and that has given also rise to some, so something that we, we in the military call for moral injuries uh, when you feel there's kind of guilt because you, you stood there you could have intervened um, but you, you couldn't because your rules said you, you couldn't do it and it can be a lot of um, internal conflicts uh, when when you think about that. But, but back to the question, uh, um, what, what do we see? We see a lot of uh, everyday stressors, the, the everyday wear and tear, uh, the conflicts between individuals, uh, the negative effects of poor leadership. Uh, that's mainly, mainly what we see. And that's not so military-like. And that's not really what people want to hear when they say, well, well <laughs> how do you treat your soul? What's, what's the issue? So, well, it's, it's basically everyday work stress related stressors. Uh, so there, there are those two, two dimensions. We have the warlike uh, dimension, the combat dimension, and we have the everyday work days. And that's basically how, how, how it is. Yeah, I can imagine that, um, yeah, when you're actually deployed and you're just living with the people that you work with for however long it might be, 12 months or whatever, and you're living mm. under very constrained conditions and rules that are imposed on you and your social life is significantly restricted. Um, but yeah, a lot of those little stresses would be um, quite magnified, uh, particularly. Yeah, to- it's a double-edged sword because uh, what we always also see is, is a really um, strengthened sense of uh, brotherhood or, or team spirit that arises from these, these uh, deployments. Uh, and you get this uh, bond uh, with a, uh, even those you don't know within the contingent or, or the deployment, uh, you get it like this, this invisible bond w- with them that is very rewarding. 
to be a, have been a part of it. And I think that that's why we see so many or, or because in Sweden now it's voluntary, you, you, you choose to, to go uh, on a deployment. Uh, and if you don't want to, you don't have to. Uh, and a lot of those who choose to go, they, they want to go again. They want to go again because we get this camaraderie uh, that you don't really can get somewhere else in, in the same sense. Uh, maybe in some of the first responders where they work in also in very specific situations, um, they, they get this, uh, that's, that the same sense, but... Uh, um, but it's it's a very fragile system because if, if somewhere in, in that system you, you bring some kind of a friction or, or conflict and you have to stay with them 24 hours a day, seven days, days a week, that might, that small conflict might uh, be like a snow, snowball effect and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so one has to be, as a leader, have to be very aware of uh, what's the status of, of the troop at any given mo moment to actually see. And we talked about that when we talked about mental, uh, mental fitness within the armed forces, uh, that we have to have a great awareness. And if we can keep that awareness high during a deployment, it, it will lessen the load on, on staff when they come home. It sounds like the sort of common um, sense of mission or purpose um, is like a, a protective factor for people then while they're deployed yeah yeah as well as well i would say that there are there i think that there are there are four identified uh, motivators towards going away uh, and, and one of them is the, the common sense of, of i would say making a difference this is a humanitarian this is i'm i'm doing a difference uh, in the world uh, basically when we come to peacekeeping missions and, and deployments it, it's one of the agendas is a, a world political, uh, safety political uh, agenda where, where we where we actually trying to lessen the impacts of uh, conflicts around the world to minimize the global threat of uh, nations uh, actually uh, coming to war with each other. But then we also have this uh, search for adventure. Most, most of the ones that go out is, is young, young guys and, and they want to go out and uh, see the world and experience uh, stuff. And they are also influenced by all of these movies that they have seen and they think they, they are like the superheroes and, and they want to go out and experience that. So that's, that's one of the motivations. Then there are economic motivations. And then for mo many of the officers, there's also motivation to uh, move move in the rank. So sometimes when you have to reach the next level, you have to have this experience for, from from being a leader uh, in, during a deployment. So uh, and we see that all of these uh, motivators uh, coexist and uh, affect them in, in different ways. When we have seen that we have troops that have experienced combat situations where they also feel they, they have been at risk uh, you see that the one that has to do the, the one uh, motivator that has to do with making a difference that one is enhanced this is real we re we are really needed here but the search for uh, adventure and monetary compensation uh, that kind of drops it, it, I, I can't do this because of money because I can't risk my life for a couple of thousand Swedish crowns but um, I can definitely do this. Uh, when I see that it actually brings something better. Uh, and maybe it's not totally, maybe some are talking about the, you know, the being in Afghanistan for, 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 for the troops, for the, for the, uh, the international troops in Afghanistan. Well, it says, well, it didn't make that much of a difference, but on, on each and every site, it makes a difference. And where the Swedes were in masar -e sharif in the Northern part, uh, on the other side from the camp, there was this girl's school. And that school would never have been an, an existing school if it wasn't for the troops to be there. So even if they were there for a limited time, during the time period of those years, uh, a lot of girls could actually go to school and learn during that time. And even though it doesn't make that big a difference uh, in in Afghanistan as a whole, for those individuals, it, it made probably a life-changing uh, difference. I mean, we see that from from all of the deployment sites that it affects individual people 
uh, right there and then. So it's, 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 it's kind of rewarding in that sense. Yeah, I can see how that would be incredibly rewarding for the troops to be able to say that they'd been there and protected the right of those girls mm. to an education. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, no, um, yeah, it's great uh, that there are those things that can buffer stress, like you say, meaning and purpose, and, and these sorts of things are very powerful buffers. Um, I was just thinking before about how you were talking about how people are living and working together. And, you know, I think um, Joelle's dark sense of humour is very lovable and endearing in short bursts, but uh, I think if we're deployed <laughs> together for 12 months, it might get pretty grating. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just imagine how my husband feels. <laughs> <laughs> the poor guy. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, tell us, uh, you know, you, you said, and actually we actually had very similar um, feedback from uh, one of our earlier ghost, uh, uh, guests, uh, Carlo um, Kapanekia, who was talking about how in first responders, it's actually not the really, you know, grotesque or um, um, uh, hard stuff that they have to see that is the main stressor of the role. But as you were saying, it's often the normal civilian type stuff, like, you know, the relationships yeah. with uh, peers and, you know, supervisory practices and that sort of thing. That actually seems to be the, the largest workplace stressor. Um, what we see uh, in, in the regular um, everyday stressors is, uh, if that was, was, was the question, is that uh, we have, one of the stressors that, that we experience is the uh, lack of uh, the, to say, rec recuperation. Uh, when you actually refill, you're, you have these uh, um, vents at home uh, that, that you can, you, can you, you, you build something up during your work day at work and then you go home and then you went with your family and you like some say, well, this happened today and this was, and so you get this, this different environments all the time that makes you possible to readapt, readjust uh, and you have that going around all, all the time. Uh, but when you're deployed, you experience the same environment 24 seven. Uh, so that's you don't you, you you can't really go go home and, and use your normal uh ways to, to rest and recuperate uh, yeah it's it's interesting i mean we we do you know all need that period for our parasympathetic nervous system right to kick in and allow that relaxation response um but if you're just constantly amongst people and you don't have your normal coping resources um you know to buffer the stress then i can imagine how that can make people you know, more stressed over time, or at least uh, contribute to, you know, they're not feeling 100%. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that one of the important part is one of my key words there are the things that this is that this is the most important part It's the aware awareness, uh, and awareness that we, we are all different, and we all uh, process the same situations in, in different ways. Uh, we, ha we have our uh, individual strength and our individual vulnerabilities and we don't always know them ourselves uh, until we experience them we have this self view that this is how i will handle that kind of kind of a stress that w when we do it and as you mentioned about the first responders i think that sometimes when it comes to these uh what if, if we, can, we can call them like uh, this basic uh, uh, military stressors, uh, uh, those uh, that we actually are preparing us for, or, or us for, for. And if you go out uh, for, for like first responder in this car accident, you have this mental preparedness, but there can be people then that are injured and this is what you have to do. Because then you are in a professional state and then you put your professional mindset and so you have like this professional uh, protection on, but when you leave that scene, you bring down that uh, uh, that protection, and you open up for and, and being just vulnerable to everyday stress, just like anyone. Uh, so just because you're you're used to handle really tough situation within your profession doesn't mean that it's a carry over to your everyday life. And uh, a friend of mine who was working in the um, say fire brigade. Uh, he, he's a, a fire. What, what do you call the fire? Yeah, fire brigade. Yeah. yeah. Fire brigade. Yeah. Uh, well, he actually said that he 
he went home from work and he came as the first civilian car to an accident. And he walked out from the car and started to, uh, I need to help. And he, he's done it like hundreds of times within his work. And he suddenly experienced that, whoa, this was something totally different. It, it was the same situation, but he was there as a civilian. And it actually uh, affected him much, much more emotionally and stressful. And he felt afterwards that this was not a pleasant experience because he actually lost his uh, his way of doing things when he was there uh, and caught off guard. So I think that shows a little bit about the, the importance and also about how, how we can actually shift this mode from, from being really this hardiness, uh, resilient mode to this vulnerable mode for the same situation, same individual, but different roles when we come into that situation. Yeah, that's a, an incredibly um, interesting observation. It never um, crossed my mind that that might be the case where you have that, like you said, the professional mode where you have your barriers up uh, and then when you're in civilian mode, those barriers can drop down and you're just not as mentally prepared to deal with those tough situations that you might come across. Yeah, and you cannot be in that professional mode all, all the time. Uh, mm. there, is, there is this model called Cooper's Collars that was actually taken. Uh, I think it has its origin from, from snipers. Uh, and uh, it's, it's basically a scale on uh, how alert or how vigilant you're supposed to be because you can't be like, you can't be super, super vigilant all the time and experience everything. And so you have to have these levels uh, and when you choose a level uh, it's much easier so say well in the current situation there is no threat at all uh, there is no task at hand so i can re i can re um, relax and i can uh, use this time to to just uh, rebuild and re go and have a drink and, and um, eat something and, and rest and then you have different levels. So when you were in the like the highest level, is, is of course the red zone. Then you have to be, have full awareness and full cognitive uh, control uh, and everything. And but you can stay in that uh, area for quite a, for so long time because then you will start to decline and lose your lose your focus. Uh, and I think that that is something that we actually do in in, in these senses when we are professionals that we we go from these. Uh, um, white zone as, as they say the, the the lowest one to the red one and then we go up and down and up and down and and if we go out of sync so that we are we are in the white zone but suddenly we experienced uh, an event that is on from the red zone level uh, th then we are quite vulnerable then we're taken off guard and and it can actually affect us much much more uh, so it, it, there's there's some models I think that are, are quite useful, and we actually use that one for ICU staff to to make them to regulate their uh, attention levels uh, to what the situation actually calls for, and not being just I have to have check on everything all the time, and then they won't last for for very long. So yeah, it'd be hugely demanding. But that's yeah, fascinating and really good use of that model, as you say. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us about then some um, systematic approaches um, that the military uses to address some of those stresses at their root cause? Yeah, uh, we actually started, uh, I think it was back in 2010, we, we, we went to this uh, conference that was held by the US Navy called the COSC conference. COSC stands for Combat Operational Stress Control. Uh, and they actually gathered some of the, the great psychiatrists and psychologists in this area of military psychology. And, and they created this concept called, uh, called COSME. It's, it's a whole doctrine. It's, it has some uh, models for the five uh, stress mediating uh, tools for, for leaders. Uh, what should be aware of as a leader, how, how to um, provide a, a stress management leadership. But they have this first uh, aid for, for stress management. And they also have this cost continuum that is a model that uh, uh, where, where you actually have this is, is, is four zones. It starts with the green zone. That, that's uh, where you're supposed to be. That's when everything that you have uh, manageable amounts of stress. And then you have this 
yellow zone it's the next step where, where you experience uh, a little bit of stress but uh, you can still afterwards when you go back to rest and recuperation you will go back uh, into the green zone again that's the ex expected ex ex expected uh, way of, of moving around you, you rest you take out rest you you use just use just uh, all the way but then we see some of them that actually travels towards uh, something where you don't really come back into the green zone again and then they have the orange zone and if you're in the orange zone too long that's like pre-illness zone if you're there too long then the wear and tear and, and cumulative stress will eventually bring you into the red zone where you have some kind of a clinical uh, level problems from it so based on that idea we, we started to uh, use it uh, uh, in in swedish armed forces back back in 2010 uh, we, we also we made this i actually found this i had this in, in my bag and i don't know if you can see it we we made these small brochures that get, gets this to to the soldiers and one of the one of the things uh, when we work with, with the soldiers is to bring, uh, as I said, awareness. And we also not just bringing awareness, we're bringing language. Uh, because when you're like in the early 20s uh, and you feel that there's something, you don't really cope with everything. It's really hard to go to a mental health professional and say something about it. Uh, because it it's not just, uh, it, it's not just that they, it's against what's, uh, it's like the military culture, uh, but, but it's also against their, their self-perception. Uh, who am I? I'm a big, strong soldier. And, and when it comes to mental health issues, that doesn't relate to me because I, I'm like a big, strong soldier. Uh, and, and if they can get awareness uh, in, in this area. So one of the, so one of the ways that we actually address this in a structure matter. So first, we, we change the wording. We talk about uh, mental fitness uh, combat combat mental fitness uh, uh, they are really really well trained in when it comes to physical fitness and physical combat fitness they know that in order to carry this backpack uh, and this heavy load for for this and that much over time and and, and and so much we need to have this basic uh, physical capacity but you also need to have a mental capacity and you need to work that out as well so we started to talk about Man, mental health fitness or combat mental health fitness uh, and uh, we introduced them to this uh, to this concept and I, I have had soldiers that were coming to me with this and said that well Nicholas I don't really know how to put this in word but I would say that I'm in the orange zone uh, so we actually brought them this symbolic way of thinking about themselves and thinking about, so what they're saying, they're, they're not saying that I am ill. They say that my combat fitness level is not in the green. My combat fitness level is in the orange zone. And that takes away a little bit about the stigma of, of this. And that makes it something that they can actually use instead as a tool set for evaluating themselves and for evaluating the others. So that the leaders, the also young leaders can see that, is my group in the green zone? So we started to doing that. And eventually during the years, we have systematized it even further. So we actually have a tool set today that we call the mental health log. Uh, and and it's, it's a tool that they each and every week on a given day, the, the lead from group leaders, even up to the CEO of the continuum has this small group and they make an evaluation. And basically, uh, without going into detail, basically it's, it's, we have created a scale on, on from, from, from the green to red and they will give a number based on that scale and, and we get an overview to see about, well, uh, the whole contingents, uh, most of the contingents is basically in, in, the, in the green so uh, as of this week uh, and so we can keep track of them over time and, and that's quite a, a relevant uh, really because we have seen from experience that we what we do is that we identify groups that are uh, really negatively affected from 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 stress uh, in ways that we would never never uh, have thought about uh, if we didn't use this so uh, 
that's one way of making it a, a structural tool uh, that's ongoing. It's not, not something that we just do, do pre-deployment or once time during deployment. And we do it on a weekly basis. And that weekly basis also brings awareness. And we were, when we have done follow-up with the leaders, they say that, well, uh, what this use of this uh, uh, reoccurring evaluation or assessment does is that it, it brings awareness from whole the week. I, I'm always aware of what uh, what's affecting my my, my staff, uh, and, and we have seen this is nothing that is just limited to the, to the armed forces. This is something you can use in, in any workplace, really, bringing this awareness. Yeah. Well. Um... Nicholas, that's um, yeah, really interesting what you're doing because obviously in a deployment situation, you can't just eliminate the workplace stresses uh, and, and really it's about how do you prepare people for that and then, um, like you're saying, reducing the stigma by using language that these people can understand and, and, uh, and acknowledge and use with treating professionals or health professionals like yourself um, you know, to, to want to talk about this. So. Uh, it's really amazing. Um, I'm also um, really interested, Nicholas, in your PhD research, right? Because you're actually now yeah. combining some of this stuff around stress and military psychology um, mm -hmm. and also now applying that within a healthcare setting as well, from, from what I understand. So would you mind telling us a little bit more about your research? Yeah, my research actually, it's, uh, I would say it it's has uh, it's two dimensions. What, what, the first dimension is basically on uh, the everyday stressors of deployment. Uh, and that's pretty much what we, we have been talking about to see what, what tools are the best tool to actually measure the uh, exposure to the whole variety of, of stressors uh, within the, the deployment cycle. Uh, and so we have done one study uh, down in uh, uh, Afghanistan and one in Mali. In the one in Afghanistan, we also measured some kind of biomarkers uh, we looked at uh, this hormone called DHSA, and we also looked at cortisol. We did some cognitive tests, uh, and uh, we also made some self-evaluation because we wanted to combine uh, some biomarkers with the self-evaluations because sometimes the self-evaluation doesn't really represent what's really going on when, when you're within this really strong culture that affects how they actually response to, to, to these uh, evaluations. But so, so that was quite interesting. And what we saw there, there was on the contrary to, towards many beliefs is that uh, the stress actually were less, the experienced stress were actually less during the deployment than, uh, than compared to at home and compared to actually control group at home as well. And I think that one of the possible explanations, we don't have the answer for this, but one of the possible explanations is that when you're at home, you have this, uh, every, you, you are exposed to basically everything. You have everyday life, you have a lot of variety. But when you go out on deployment, you go on the deployment in one specific position and you're well trained and prepared for that specific. So the, the, the the experienced sense of control over that situation is really, really high. So you are experienced stressors. And I use a tool called PSS-14 that has two subscales. One that addresses positive stress, that stress that you feel that you have some kind of uh, impact on. You can handle it. You, you have the tools to, and resources to, and to manage it. And, and there is some negative stressors. And the negative stressors are the ones that are out of your hand. You can't really do anything about them. Uh, so you're you're just a victim uh, of, of the, those stressors, um, and we see that uh, both of these stressors actually um, lessens the positive stressors. They're, they're quite stable, but the negative stressors actually you see that those the, those are minimized during deployment. So there, there's less of them, and I think that the sense of control. I I, I actually have control over my situation. And I also have a group surrounding me that are in the same area. They're in the same box. They're, they're doing, working in the same, um, with the same control in this. So I have this peer support in a way that I don't have at, at, at home. That's, that's one part of, of the studies. And I think that the results um, has to uh, 
make us even look even further into that, into the future? Or what, what are these positive aspects? Uh, how, how can we enhance even the positive aspects of it to, to, to make them e- e- even stronger? Because that helps us uh, to, to actually uh, prevent this wear, wear and tear. And, and there's actually been also some kind of, kind of studies I recall two studies by this Swedish researcher called Gary, Gary Larson, Larson that has looked upon what they call daily hassles and daily uplifts. And daily hassles, that's the hassles in everyday life. But we also have um, uh, an amount of daily uplifts. Uh, that, that's the positive things of, of life. Just joking around at work, uh, meeting an old friend in the street. Um, things that is unexpected, but... Uh, positive and it lifts us up. And when we have a balance where we have more of those positive uplifts than we have of the, of the daily hassles, um, it's a positive end result. So we try to view that also in, in that, uh, look at that also in the department uh, perspective. So, so that, that's one part. The other part is more related to military training. Uh, and we have done uh, a couple of studies on uh, conduct after pack capture training. Uh, conduct after capture training or SEER training as it also is called search, uh, survive, evade, resist, uh, extract. Um, it, it has to do with when you end up in a really, really negative situation, you've been taken capture by, by someone. This is mainly uh, directed towards solitary positions within the arm, uh, like military observers, but also uh, flight s- staff that might uh, have to evacuate the plane within enemy territory. Uh, and um, they, they get a, uh, the set of, of uh, sk- sk- methods to how to endure uh, being taken capture. We also give this training, the Swedish Armed Forces also give this training to some journalists. Uh, so journalists that go into really dangerous area, they also get this kind of training. And there has been some uh, real life feedback uh, from the journalists that has been taken ca- captured. For example, there was one uh, that was taken captured in Syria uh, and he had gone through these Courses and he, he, he said that, well, when this happened, this is a really, really stressful situation. But you have some kind of experience and you have some kind of an idea, some kind of model to cling on to. And when you do that, you kind of lessen the stress level a little bit. Uh, I don't think that it uh, prevents him from being uh, susceptible to PTSD afterwards because this is really like some really uh, harsh situation, but it might increase the cognitive capacity and ability to actually use your resources at the time to end up surviving. So, so we have done studies on that and we also looked at some biomarkers, uh, stress biomarkers, we looked at cognitive performance in relation to that really, really intense and stress exposure. And we see that when um, this has actually been done several years ago, also by the Americans, and, and we see the same result that the, the stress cortisol level actually goes through the roof during this uh, exercise. But we also see that the, the time from being almost uh, blocked and frozen within cognitive capacity within these uh, uh, training situations, it costs, it's, it's a really, really short time to come back, uh, to get, regain your um, freeze, go from cognitive freeze to um, having your capacity, capacity again. So that's also one great experience. And when we did it, we, we did it with three different groups. And one of the groups, um, they had a little bit of previous experience in, in this. Uh, they were becoming uh, conduct after capture instructors afterwards. So they had gone through a similar exercise before. The, 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 the training was much longer, so they had gotten to know each other before. Uh, and, and they were also well rested and well fed when they went into, into the exercise. Um, and their l- levels of stress hormones were significantly lower. So we say that the, there's so many confounders there. So we can't say that this is the one, this is the one. This is just like 
uh, it's convenience sample. We, we do what we can, we, mm. we, we can do research with what's going on really with plants. So it's not like we select them and put them through a specific uh, training paradigm. We, we just have to observe what's already happening. Uh, and so, but we can see that there is definitely some, within some of these uh, factors, there is definitely some, some, some factor. I think that we can learn things from that that we can take out into the civil world uh, uh, afterwards. And that's that's the main goal, of course, to, to use this knowledge to something good. Yeah, I, I can see why your PhD is taking so long. It's quite some many subjects that you're uh, getting into there. Yeah, uh, as I said, why it's taking so long is basically because when, when you have done all these fun things, you have to write about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I understand. So, yeah, that's why I didn't go yeah. down the academic yeah. route. The, the writing's <laughs> always the hard part. Doing the research is the interesting part, but then writing about it afterwards is the challenge. Yeah, and just knowing it's going to be written yeah, it by uh, peer sure, reviewers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, look, this is really, really interesting stuff, and you've got me sort of thinking about um, some of the other research on like um, sort of practice effects and um, the impact of mentally rehearsing different scenarios um, before you're actually confronted with them and that um, you can, from your brain's perspective, um, if you can imagine it really well, then it's almost the same as already having done it. So you can actually sort of have these practice effects um, just from imagining something rather than actually going through it. And it seems like that's probably coming through in in some of what you're saying there in terms of the, um, you know, if you're able to prepare people for those capture situations and if they're able to, you know, imagine it and, and mentally rehearse it, then almost it's like the scripts in their brain start running um, yeah. when that thing happens and their brain already knows, okay, well, we do this and then we do this and then this happens and then we do that next. So it takes away a lot of the cognitive load of trying to think, oh, no, now what do I do? And having to try and think your way through it, you already know, you've already practiced it and your brain just takes you through those steps. That sort of seems a little bit like what's going on there. Exactly. And I think that that's what's been going on for several years within some high risk professions, such as pilots, uh, where they have the simulation, simulation train, training centers. Uh, and I think it's, it's been uh, very expensive. Uh, it's, it's, uh, for, for, that, for that area, it, it has to do, do with a lot of uh, the equipment, the technological equipment. But if you conduct after capture, it takes a lot of personal resources to actually set, set it up and so but there there are actually some projects going on internationally with uh, virtual reality uh, where you can actually bring these training paradigms uh, especially they, they have some some kind of tra- training uh, it's, a, it's a british guy uh, who is a computer technician who was taking capture i think it was in iraq uh, that had took an interest in this and he's creating some kind of uh, of, of a software uh, for virtual reality to to because it's not just military stuff and, and, and journalists. There's also uh, all of these other uh, professions that goes to these areas uh, and they they're building they in, in many of these countries. For example, Afghanistan as an example, they are rebuilding uh, infrastructures uh, in order to create a, a, a working society. And a lot of these workers, they are not high profile militaries or or that that get this kind of training. So, but they can still with, with this. Um, yeah, other this new availab- availability. Uh, uh, experience the same training as exactly as you point out you, you establish some kind of cognitive schemes that you can actually uh, just trigger when in such a situation and uh, even though every situation is a new situation you will have something to something to cling on to what was i supposed to do instead of just feeling well i have no idea whatsoever so mm-hmm. i think it's it's a great one i think if you could use it also in uh, in uh, training for for first responders uh, and other groups so i had to put this, this the sun is coming now from from my window here so i had to put this down <laughs> it's that time of day over there. Too bright. yeah so but as you say you know a lot of that stuff that you're working on could quite easily uh be translated into civilian use as well yeah yeah uh, yeah, and for as an example we talked about this i showed you this small this combat uh, cost and we actually did a similar one. Uh, you can't see it here, but it says 
mental health for personal and care. And we did this for ICU staff. And it's basically the same one. It's, uh, we used uh, another kind of uh, symbol language, making it more accessible for that kind of group. And you don't change the uh, mental health in healthcare by providing a small uh, brochure or uh, some printout that they can bring with them. but. Uh, when we are starting to talking about it in a structured matter and providing them, just as we did with the soldiers, providing them with the tool set uh, that this is a way we can communicate, this is how we can look at it, like look at each other, then we gain some kind of uh, increased awareness. Um, so, uh, and that's what we are aiming for, in increasing awareness within the staff and with the leaders within the staff. And it's, it's a really hard work. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine within healthcare and in, in the military, I guess you'd have some similar kind of macho kind of uh, personalities where they're like, this is something that, you know, is I, I'm tough, I can endure this. And I, you know, I want to be in stressful situations. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really, really interesting uh, aspect, because we see that some of these stressors that the general public ex say that well, this, this must be the worst are actually the stresses that is sought for by, by this, this, why do you become a, 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 a paramedic? Why do you become a police officer? Some of little aspect with, within you also, I don't know if it's, it's the right word, but some kind of enjoys or is fed by this, uh, the scenarios that you can experience. Uh, and, and some that has been in, in combat situation all to say that but this is how you really, really feel alive. So it's uh, it's not really politically correct to say that you thrive within this averse situation. But to be honest, there is a, a lot of, of actually the people that actually thinks that this is something also that, uh, that brings meaning for me as, a, as an individual to be in this situation. That this is a tree. It's a trigger for, for, for those people. Yeah. Uh, I guess a lot of people would select into those sort of professions because of that perceived kind of um, work um, that's often glamorized, as you mentioned before, uh, in TV and, and movies. Uh, what they don't self-select for is, you know, uh, unbearable workloads and bad leadership yeah. practices and, you know, bad relationships with co-workers and that sort of thing. I think also it was from, from one of your podcasts. It was, I don't remember, recall the, the name of the guest, but she talked about uh, stuff that kind of looks at uh, disturbing pictures, pictures of violence. Uh, and, and you can do that for my, like five, 10 years. But then suddenly something happens within your life and, and you, so that suddenly you achieve a, a vulnerability to that area. Uh, I think she mentioned that when you get a kid for yourself, yeah. Uh, yeah. suddenly you get a totally different relationship to other, other kids as well and being a parent and, uh, and everything. And that can actually bring you out of that uh, sense of I can handle this because you can't really anymore because you've got a different frame of re relation to, to, this, uh, to this area. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's an interesting point as well. I guess that would change over time, your um, ability to cope with certain traumatic things. Um, you're talking about Dia Day's episode on vicarious trauma. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Nicholas, we, we've been having a fantastic chat. I just realized the time has just flown. Um, and, um, you know, you've been sharing so many great things. You, you mentioned before how you really liked when you listened to some of our previous episodes, if there was, you know, one or two, Good takeaways. I think we've got quite a few out of today's episode. That's definitely unique um, to this conversation. So thank you so much for that. Um, but what what are some of your hopes for the future of workplace mental health? I mean, this is an area obviously you've been working in for a while as a um, practitioner, now an academic, and you hope to go back in and work in military psychology again as a practitioner. So what are your hopes for the future? I think I, I hope that there is this area uh, also within. The, the military called welfare. And welfare is so often a, a position within a, a continuum that has to do with uh, the welfare officer has to uh, observe the, 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 the whole uh, the continuum, observe the psychosocial workload, uh, uh, the physical, uh, every, everything, and, and see what, 
how what what can we do that actually brings uh, those daily uplifts to the staff? Uh, and I think that when you look at some of the huge IT companies, uh, what, they, what they started to compete with was not big salaries because that was not what, what uh, brought the, the, the attractive names in. They have to work with other things. They have to work with uh, different kind of things that you, you, you don't put a number to it. It has to, uh, this was in America, so that they had like the child care at work. They had this the laundry service. They're taking care of things that um, are part of these daily hassles and they bring this uh, welfare uh, approach to, 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 your, to, to your work. And I think that that is something, at least here in Sweden, that's really hard to get acceptance for. It's really easy to say, well, we'll increase your salary in this and that much uh, if you do this and that. But you say, okay, let's bring free lunches. You get free lunch. You don't have to think about going out by lunch. You bring with you this food box, or or we we, we use these uh, other uh, supportive uh, areas to create a better working environment. Uh, and for example, uh, we we could use planned uh, physical activity. Uh, it's a part of the job to do some kind of physical activity. It's not like it's just left up to you to, to do it. And I think that that welfare concept, how do, how do we create well-being uh, is something that I hope uh, will, will be one of the changes. I don't think that we can lessen the uh, cognitive load and the stressors that this new society has evolved into. But realizing that this is a new kind of uh, stresses that is causing these horrendous numbers we need to not just address uh, resilience and stress management. We also need to see, okay, we know that if we have a positive balance, more positive life events, more positive work life related events, we get a higher endurance or, or, and higher acceptance of, of these uh, negative stressors. So I hope that that will be, that is something that I'm, I'm going to try to pursue the awareness of their importance and also economical benefits of, of providing welfare. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the key aspects. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting observation. I mean, we talk about um, reducing exposure to work-related stress, but stress is cumulative, right? And it can um, come yeah. from work-related stresses that might be your daily hassles at home, uh, as you've suggested. So any work that an employee can do to reduce the stresses either from those daily outside hassles or the work-related stresses would have that cumulative benefit for people's well-being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Mm, some great ideas there. Um, so for the people who are listening who are maybe thinking about a career in this area of psychological health and safety, do you have some words of advice that you'd like to offer them? Um, yeah, first thing, uh, I think that one has to follow your, you find, have to find your own motivation. What do I think is fun? Uh, but because when you think things are fun, you thrive, you, 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 you grow with that. Uh, so uh, what aspects, of, and that's the beauty with psychology, because you can actually find psychology in each and every area uh, out there. Uh, and if you want to pursue in, in this, uh, this area, uh, Okay, why? Why do I want to do it? So you get in terms to why you want to do it, and, and then you just find the things that you think are most fun, and that will bring you that uh, not just the motivation, but also the, uh, the the struggle when it doesn't go your way. You, you will keep on doing it because you think that this is something that I really want to uh, really want to, to pursue. So. Um, in, in Sweden, you, you can uh, get specialized, of course, when, after you become a psychologist, you can get specialized in organizational psychology. Uh, I have not done that. Uh, I'm still just doing what I'm motivated by and what I think is most fun. And no, no, so no, no need to specialize, uh, Nicholas. You, you don't have to specialize. No. <laughs> yeah. Just do, do what, what you think you, you're comfortable with. And, and, uh, I think that we, we can bring so much. Uh, we are looking into an area where um, I think that many of the management, they are um, 
they don't have the time or resources to actually do it. So uh, if, even if we just can affect uh, just a small part, it makes a difference. So I'm not sure that uh, is a recommendation or any guidance for, for but uh, follow your inner compass, do, do what you think is fun, and then it becomes uh, good in some sense. No, I think that's great advice. Um, any any work that has that intrinsic reward and, and where you yeah. feel like you're, you're contributing something meaningful to the world um, is always going to help you to maintain your motivation and maintain your um, positive mindset um, in the face of adversary. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, uh, it's been a fantastic chat, Nicholas. I think we got through our whole agenda and I think we might have set a, uh, a record for the longest podcast episode as well. You just unpacked so much new content on us, which is fantastic. So, <laughs> no, I, I, I always speak too much. Uh, that's one of my uh, <laughs> lim limit myself. But I hope that something great comes out of it. Something good. Yeah, some definitely unique stuff that our, our other guests haven't spoken about before. So fantastic. So uh, look, that, that brings us to the end of, of the episode today. So thanks yeah. very much to the listeners for, for listening in. Um, if you uh, enjoy shorter clips rather than the long format podcasts that we have, don't forget that we um, do post little uh, short clips on the Flourish DX LinkedIn uh, channel so you can check them out. If you want to see the video and see the interrogation room, that uh, <laughs> Nicholas is in, um, and, the really nice <laughs> and the and the uh, the sun coming through the window. Make sure you check out the video on the YouTube channel for Flourish TX, uh, and also Joel and I are pretty active on LinkedIn. I've seen Nicholas on there quite a bit as well. So feel free to follow us or connect with us over LinkedIn to continue the conversation uh, online. So thanks uh, again to to Nicholas. Thanks to Joel, and uh, thanks to listeners. And we'll catch you next episode.